Hey there, welcome back to the Path to Zion podcast, where we are rediscovering the ancient way. You can find us over at pathtozion.com or right here, of course, on our on our YouTube channel. Um, 24-7, in the middle of the night, you can't sleep, you know, pull up one of my podcasts and maybe it'll put you to sleep. I don't know what it'll do. What are we talking about? Something that every man needs. I believe it's eyes to see. We see this pattern as we briefly looked into Luke chapter 24 when Yeshua post-resurrection decides to go for a walk with these two brothers on this road called Emmaus, and what happens? He opens their eyes to see something that, as we looked at in the Greek, said what? It was previously closed before to the Scriptures, which again baffles me because we know what these men encountered walking alongside Yeshua himself and watching him do all that he did and doing all that they did themselves. Something was still lacking, and on the other side of his resurrection, the first thing Yeshua went to was the Scriptures. I think that's a marked thing that that needs noted, that he could have gone to anything, as we talked about in part one. He could have gone to any other thing, any other topic, to illuminate their understanding towards him. What was it? The scriptures, as he talked about, the Torah of Moses, the prophets, and even the Psalms, how they pointed to himself. Their eyes were opened, and they were able to see. And we talked, of course, in measure also about this mystery of, of of having eyes to see. And why do some of us have it and some of us don't? It's just a mystery to me. And so what we're going to do as promised is we're going to read a whole lot of scriptures here for uh, several pages. Um, So pay attention because we're wanting to allow the word of Elohim to set a precedence of different patterns of men being given eyes to see or not having eyes to see. And just kind of a scriptural groundwork, if you will, uh, to provoke our thought towards what the Word says about this matter, not whatever we conjure up in our own minds and imaginations. Um, So let's go ahead and read this. Genesis chapter 3 seems like a good place to start, as we talked about a little bit already. Um, Beginning in verse 4, the serpent said to Eve, you most assuredly won't die, for Yahweh knows that when you eat of the tree, your your eyes will be opened and you will be like what? Elohim. Okay? So here's the, the first insertion, as we referenced in part one as well, of, of your, your eyes being opened. Okay? It was a lie. It was a deception being told to Eve that she would become like Elohim herself, knowing good and evil when this would take place. And so the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a thing of lust for what? Her eyes. Okay, you see this precedence at the very beginning, as Yahweh always does in his word, and that the tree was desirable for imparting wisdom, so she took of its fruit, and of course she ate, and she shared some with her husband, and he ate as well. And then what happens in verse 7? Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves loin coverings. I say all the time, so many talk about... um, the liar, deceiver, the serpent, the adversary, you know, Tassatan. Well, and I say this, and you have to hold this, you know, this takes time to explain these things, but it wasn't necessarily a lie, friend. I mean, what he told them is what happened. <laughs> they had their eyes open to something that they didn't have before that they weren't supposed to see and weren't supposed to be aware of and walking according to. And by doing that, they tried to become like Elohim, which is in fact what they did. It's the same thing with the Tower of Babel. Yahweh looks down. He's speaking with all the council of heaven. And he says, we've got to put an end to this. Go down there and look at it because we got a big problem. What did he say the problem was? They're becoming like us. They're going to be like me. They're ascending to where I am, my abode, and I'm not having it. There's one Elohim and one Elohim alone, period. And so there is something, the thread of truth, I'll say, at least in this, that we need to get through our minds that what they were told, that they would be given eyes to see in a perverted, wrong way, was true. Because we see that, of course, by what happened when they took of it and ate. And just to be clear, um, just just to instate this pattern, we'll just jump around in uh, this Genesis 3 text, your eyes will be opened. Um, you'll know good and evil. Again, this goes back to what? A, a, an opening of one's understanding. The woman saw with her eyes that the tree was good for food. 
through what? The lust for the eyes, um, that it was desirable. She took it and ate, and then what? The eyes of, the, of both of them were what? They were opened, okay? And they knew their own condition. All of a sudden, there was a problem that did not exist before. Deuteronomy chapter 29, um, 1 through 4a. Moses called to all of Israel and said to them, You've seen all of, of what Yahweh did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and all his servants and all his land, the great trials that your eyes saw, those great signs and wonders. But to this day, Yahweh has not given you a heart to know or eyes to see or ears to hear. I led you 40 years in the wilderness." We're laying a groundwork theme here. Ezekiel chapter 12, the word of Yahweh came to me saying, Son of man, you live in the midst of a rebellious house. They have eyes to see, but do not see. Ears to hear, but they do not hear. They are a rebellious house. Rebellion will keep us from having eyes to see, friend. You, son of man, prepare supplies for exile. Go into exile by day in their sight. Go away as if into exile from your home to another place in their sight. Perhaps they will recognize that they are a rebellious house. Yahweh speaking to Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 34, and he says the following, Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. Yahweh showed him all of the land, Gilead to Dan, and all of Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negev and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. Then Yahweh said to him, This is the land that I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your seed. I let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over there. So Moses, the servant of Yahweh, died there in the land of Moab, as was from the mouth of Yahweh. Okay, just again, I'm going to say this every verse. Eyes to see. Moses was given eyes to see something, but he was also prohibited to going to what he was beholding with his own eyes. We'll get to all these things in greater measure in a moment. A notable account, I think, with Elisha and his servant. Um, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15 and on. Um, when the attendant of the man of Yah had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was surrounding the city. So his attendant said to him, Alas, my master, what are we going to do? Fear not, he replied, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, Yahweh, please open his eyes that he may see. So Elisha prayed and said, Open his eyes that he may see. And Yahweh opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. This is just, to me, a little prophetic picture of, of literally what the text says, which is being given eyes to see. Something that was right there the whole time, but he did not have the capability of, of, of taking it in. He, he couldn't... He literally didn't have the ability to see what was right there the whole time. That's a whole teaching all by itself, is it not? Acts chapter 26, 15 through 18. Shaul Paul, who had just been blinded, mind you, he's recounting his encounter with Yeshua. Then I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Yeshua, whom you're persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you. Why? For this purpose to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things you have seen, as well as to the things I will yet reveal to you. So here's both. This is an ongoing revelation of Messiah. This is what all of us need, friend, an ongoing revelation of Messiah. Eyes to see is not, boom, eyes to see, and you see it all. It is a, I believe, it is an ongoing, perpetual, repetitious cycle of a man who is pursuing Father's ways. Back to the text. Verse 16, I will rescue you from your own people and from the Goyim Gentiles to whom I'm sending you. And why did he send um, Shaul Paul there? To open their eyes <laughs> so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to Yahweh, that they may receive release from sins as well as a place among those who are made holy through trusting in me. 
That's a mouthful. Okay, so again, make a little earmark on this because this is going to be where we culminate here in a little bit. The, the charge given to Shaul was what? Uh, he, he's opening Shaul's eyes, Paul's eyes, and, and it, the, all this stuff is unfolding. Revelation is coming, and it's going to come again more. And, and by the way, you're going to go and, and open their eyes. Okay, this, this ongoing revelation should be something that spreads, friend. Luke chapter 24, 44 um, and 45, we have read twice already. And what? Yeshua opened their minds and understanding to understand the scriptures. Ephesians chapter 1, 16 through 19. I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the Elohim of our Lord Yeshua, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. Verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the boundless greatness of his power toward us who believe. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, For this reason, since we have this ministry, just as we received mercy, we do not lose heart. Instead, we renounce the hidden shameful ways, not walking in deception or distorting the word of Elohim, but commending ourselves before Elohim to everyone's conscience by the open proclamation of the truth. And even if our good news is veiled, okay, listen to the word, the verbiage here. Even if the good news is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. So there's this divide, there's this discrepancy between who's, who's seeing and who is not. Verse 4, in their case, the Elohim of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the good news of the glory of Messiah, who is the image of Elohim. Now hit the pause button here real quick. I believe this is, this is not as simple as what we have inherited and been told. We would be told this is just all towards the the non-believing atheists in the world and the bad people. Friend, I believe this is this is much more serious than what we have been told. And and we have to be careful that we don't just read this and categorize everybody out here and we would never be included in that camp. They're surely not talking about me in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul's not talking about me. Is it possible that the good news has been veiled to us as well, friend. I, I reached that point in my life um, for absolute sure. I did not know the full gospel until very, very, very recently. I thought Jesus just came to get rid of my sin and, and purchase me so that I can know the Father and go to heaven. Um, I knew a lot more than that, but I'm just still saying there's just a, a, a traditional gospel was all I knew um, for most of my life. But... I believe there's more to this good news reality that the Elohim of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving towards. And friend, the unbelieving is more than just the atheist down the road who hates God and hates America. Okay, We have to be careful of who we're including and excluding um, when we read these texts. Um, let's move on. In light of this, let's be cautious as we pray for those that we love to have their eyes opened. Um, and, 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 okay, well, I have to read the end of that text to, for what I'm going to say next to make sense. Um, cause then we're going to shift into a conclusion here, um, for our last little bit. And we're going to, we're going to bring this, this discussion of something that, that every man needs, which is eyes to see into something that we can participate in actively, something we can be doing daily in our lives during our time of prayer and, um, and communing with the father, um, towards ourselves, of course, all day long, but also outwardly towards others, people we love in our, in our homes, in our families, in, in the periphery of our life, to our neighbors and strangers even that we'll meet, okay? Because this, this should look like something. Um, but let's culminate with uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I need to read this before I read the next part. We do not proclaim ourselves, but instead Messiah Yeshua as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Yeshua's sake. For Elohim, who said, let, let light shine out of the darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of Elohim in the face of Messiah. Paraphrased. Look, 
We have been moved from darkness to light. Okay, we've been moved from death to life. We have been in this regenerated new creation condition because of the gift of the Father and His mercy and His kindness towards us that we do not deserve nor ever earn. We must thereby, if that's really true in what has happened, it must look like something out here. It must be something that this light that's within me is released, if you will, to shine and be a declaration to any who would look upon my life as saying, this is something about this man. There's something about that individual that looks different than my darkness. You understand what I'm saying? Because many are, are blinded in this condition we just read by the, the Elohim of this world. That's a no-brainer. Darkness is everywhere, and it sure isn't just out in the world. It's in the, it's in the body of Messiah all day long. And it would do us well to just admit that um, and, and mature from there. Um, and so in light of this is what I was about to get to. Let us be cautious as we pray for those that we love to have their eyes opened, that we ourselves do not return to darkness ourselves, okay? 1 John 2, 9 says, The one who says that he is in the light and yet hates his brother or sister is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother and sister remains in the light, and there is nothing in him to cause stumbling, but the one who hates his brother or sister is in the darkness, and he walks in the darkness, and he does not know where he's going. Why? Because the darkness has blinded his eyes, friend, one who loves as Messiah loved will not be found in the darkness, okay? And will not be found condemning others who are in darkness, but instead will be found crying out for their eyes to be open and for the scales to fall from their eyes and that they would have the same mercy given to them that we have been shown, okay? as recipients of this great light and carriers of it, to use it rightly, to go back to what Shaul was saying about why he was even called to proclaim the good news in the gospel, to bring others who are in darkness out into what? His marvelous light. So my prayer recently for others that I love, okay, and long to see their eyes be opened to Father's ways, just like Psalm 119, as I referenced earlier, earlier, and let me tell you exactly, practically speaking, what I've been trying to do with more regularity um, as of late. Do good to your servant that, that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes so I may behold wonders from your Torah. What I've been able to do, and I'm trying to practice this becoming um, not monotonous, but something I do with great regularity without a lot of thought and training. I'm still in the training part. Um, I've, begun, I've began to practice inserting the name of people that I love into this verse um, as I ask, ask the Father to do for them what he's done for me in my household. I should know nothing here. I should know nothing. <laughs> I should be in darkness. I should be ignorant. I should, be, should have been left to my former condition um, going the ways of the nations that I had inherited. Um, why have I been given eyes to see, to kick us all the way back to where we started at the beginning of this in part one? Why have I been given eyes to see anything? I don't know. I don't know. So, so my charge is simple, to bring this again to a practical end. Um, how much are we crying out for people that we love to have their eyes opened by the Father to see His wonderful ways? Um, more than any other thing that we do in response to anyone else's rejection of what we have seen, okay? Just like, okay, practical example. Open Bill's eyes so that he may behold wonders from your Torah, okay? You understand what I'm saying? This is not complex. Just crying out to the Father, open their eyes, Father, to see the beautiful wonders from your Torah. I don't know why they don't see it. I don't know why I didn't see it as we continue this mystery and the discussion of it. More than any other thing that we do. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a critical thinker and I'm a critiquer of Christianity. That's okay. That's fine. We Someone has to. We have to come across um, in whatever ways we can in humility and in patience and in kindness and confront what we have been handed and what we just talked about in last studies, especially even the Christmas one, 
we have we have inherited the traditions of our elders, and we have the, we have done exactly what Yeshua confronted the non-believing Pharisees of doing, which is what you have nullified and made to no effect the very word of Elohim because of your traditions. Someone has to say that yes and amen all day long, and that will not change. And Equally, we need to cry out for our Father to show these people kindness that the scales would fall from their eyes and that whatever needs to happen in their hearts to get them to that moment like Shaul Paul had when he encountered Yeshua and like so many of us have had and in, 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 in needed, just like the two men on the road to Emmaus where Yeshua comes, boom, a moment happens where something that was closed before was opened to the scriptures. Friend, that has got to happen for humanity. It has got to happen, and praise the Father, it's happening right now within the Christian church. People are having encounters with Messiah, and their eyes are being opened to the scriptures. We are living that ourselves. We have dozens and dozens of people in our in our immediate circle, in hundreds, just a step out here, and thousands, if you get into um, computer uh, internet platforms, thousands and thousands of people who are having this road to Emmaus experience, which is, I've known Jesus, I've walked with Jesus, but I've had this encounter where Yeshua Messiah, the one who came to restore all things, and do a whole lot more than just save me from my sin. I've encountered him for who he really is. Oh my gosh, he's opened my eyes to the scriptures. And friend, this is a huge, this is more than just like a doctrinal shift in position or a different understanding. This is something revelational. It's something that literally moves us from darkness to light in a way that we just we just were, we just didn't get it. Let's just make it real simple. We didn't get it. We encountered Messiah for who he really was in the full gospel, in, the, in the, all these things, the covenantal understanding of the new covenant. Oh my gosh. What? We've been given eyes to see. <laughs> and so may we cry out for those that we know and love. Let me give you an analogy and we'll bring this to a close today. I shared this with a group about three weeks ago, maybe four now. I was sharing some of this um, study with, with a group of people. And, and I gave them an example of something that, that kind of resonated with them. We'll see if it does again here. It makes sense to me. Um, hunting season is coming to a close here where I live, deer hunting. And I was driving to work, and, and one of the ways I go to work is through a national forest. It's just this... Oh my gosh, my son calls it the Wiggly Road. It'll make you sick if you eat and then drive on it, but it's just, it's beautiful, but it's just nothing but the forest, obviously. It's national forest land, and there's pull offs um, along it as you go the length of this road. And again, deer hunting season is full on at that point, several weeks back. And there was a truck pulled off, and because I enjoy hunting, I took notice that there was a truck in one of the pull offs. So as I'm coming up on it, I wanted to look and just I don't know why, just curiosity. I wanted to look and see, is it somebody walking out to hunt? Is it someone coming back? No big reason. But as I looked, I saw a an unmanned truck sitting there in the pull-off in the National Forest and a very, very large deer right in front of the truck, probably a foot away from the hood. And I'm, I am in the, in the zone towards what I've just shared to you in this uh, series about eyes to see. And I just kind of chuckled to myself as I'm communing with the Father during my drive. And I, and I felt like this. And, and I'll, I'll just stick to what I, what I read. Sometimes I think in our, uh, what I wrote rather, sometimes I think in our zeal and even proper desire for others to see what we see. We can tend to venture out into the woods with an arsenal of weaponry and resources. And perhaps there are times that we should just sit in the truck and instead put our time and effort into prayer and fasting that Father will do his supernatural work instead in the hearts of people that we love. To use the metaphor clear in case it's not already. This man was probably out in the woods. 
He had his rifle. He had his vest on. He may have a deer call. He may have antlers to rub together. He may have washed his clothes in dirt and leaves for a year to get ready for this day and to go out and sit in the woods at the perfect spot, maybe for hours, okay? Whether he got a deer that day or not, don't know. But the irony was, all that effort that that man probably went to, went through to go out there and to sit, a deer walked up to his truck that he parked there, and it, the deer just stood there. Okay, it it just there was this interesting irony, and as I thought about this that I'm presenting um, in this series. It resonated with me. A lot of times, especially if you're at all like me, you're just a passionate person. You just want somebody to get it. Oh, oh, if they could only see what I see. Yes and amen. In a rightful measure, in self-control as a mature spiritual man. But may we spend our time where it's not whether it matters more. We're not trying to weigh these things back and forth, which is better. But we have to elevate properly is what I'm trying to say. Prayer and fasting and crying out to the Father to what? To say, open so-and-so's eyes, Father, so that he may behold, so that she may behold the wonders of your Torah. Are we spending ample amounts of time doing that? Or, to use this uh, metaphor, are we just out in the woods looking and looking and looking and trying and preparing and, and all these things when maybe Father's just wanting to bring them into his ways right up to us or just right up to himself and bypass us altogether. More than sharing Bible verses, more than making sure they know how wrong they are or us as we gather talking about how wrong this group is and how that group doesn't see it and that group doesn't see it. More than we talk amongst ourselves when we gather together about how rejected we are by them. More than how we find camaraderie in the fact that so many people just don't want to hear what we have to say. It is Father's supernatural work to accomplish and not ours. We will be used, yes and amen. I hope so. I hope so. I believe that's a scriptural pattern. We look at Shaul Paul's life. We see that's exactly what happened on the other side of him being sent out. So the conclusion, may we prayerfully cry out for all men, all men, all men, <laughs> to be given eyes to see. And to end where we started, Yeshua opened their minds to understand the scriptures. I believe it would do us wonders if we followed this pattern and if we cried out to him to do the same thing for us here today and in the lives of the people around us that we love and long so bad to get this, to get the greater understanding and have eyes to see. So I hope this has been an encouragement and a little bit of a challenge here at the end. Um, you've been watching the Path Design podcast. We're rediscovering the ancient way here. It is a beautiful way that is right there in Luke chapter 24 where Yeshua himself, when he could have said anything in the whole wide world and opened their minds to anything at all, he opened their minds to the scriptures. I love it. I love it. Thank, Oh, man, thank the Father for this invitation to walk in his ancient way. Reach out to us anytime at pathdesignpodcast at gmail.com. Like, subscribe, all those things, whatever you want to do. Uh, talk to us if you want to. Um, we are all ears. Amen. <laughs>